spend a little bit of time talking about the quantity theory of money. Now, essentially, this is a classical theory of uh, belonging to the macroeconomics family. Um, it is a very simple relationship of four variables. Uh, and today, we're going to understand exactly what, what this equation is trying to tell us. And the equation that we're, we're going to look at is, is this. You see, I promise you, right, it's just four very simple variables. Um, nothing too complicated here. Uh, so let's go through the variables one by one, and then I'll tell you a little story about um, how they came up with this with this uh, equation right here. Okay, now M. Now M is the um, money supply in the economy. Okay, and this is in nominal terms. Okay, um, the difference between nominal and real, or what they call real balances, is basically um, this is in value form. So, how many million dollars or trillion dollars that the economy has uh, in, in monetary form? Um, your your real balances or your real money supply is going to be M over P instead. So, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, keep in mind that this is a uh, nominal value. And this V over here stands for the velocity. Now, velocity is essentially the number of times money changes hands uh, in an economy. So, let's say in one in, in one year itself, okay, uh, let's say it, it, um, there's only two people in this economy, you and me, and if I got five dollars with me, and if I use this five dollars to buy, um, I don't know, coffee from you, uh, and and I pass that five dollars over to you. Throughout the entire year, that's the only tran transaction done. So that means the velocity of money is simply just one. Okay, so in, in in short, velocity is the number of times money changes hands. Okay. Okay. So so that's for velocity. Um, there's no need to complicate over velocity because, uh, as you will soon realize, we will assume that um the the rate of change of velocity, right? Um. The percentage change of velocity is pretty much stable, uh, so we can actually drop this variable later. Uh, but we'll stick with this first. Now, P is the price level. Okay, I think that's pretty straightforward. Okay, the average price level of, of your goods, um, and this is in nominal form, obviously. Okay, and now Y is output. Now, um, a lot of people think that. Um, you know, output, as you see in your ISLM model, or even ADS model, they think that Y is actually a nominal um, denomination of, your, of, of, of goods. You know, because some people think that it's, you know, it's GDP, etc. But essentially, uh, when we do macroeconomics or in any other form of theory, right, um, Y is actually a real uh, denomination. Okay, so it is actually like the total amount of goods and services produced. So this is a real value. And that is why if you take uh, the price level and you multiply that by um, the amount of goods and, and services produced by the economy, you get the nominal value of um, the country's GDP. So these two together, multiplied together, you will get the nominal value of your bloody GDP. Okay, so so that's that's um that's something that everybody should take note of when you draw your ISLM model. Okay, just understand that your horizontal axis represents a real variable and not a nominal variable. Okay, and obviously this side okay is the nominal value of money, right? So okay, uh, not exactly nominal value of money because this is M over here, so that's already the nominal value of money, so this will be the nominal value of all the transactions done, okay? Okay, great. So, um, now I'm going to go into a little story on how this equation was formed. Um, it's not exactly uh, the true story, but it's, it's kind of like my version of it. Um, okay, so, I'm just going to... Okay, this is a little... A little uh, scenario that I've drawn out. Okay, we'll go through this one by one. Okay, um, there were two friends. Okay, I haven't given them names yet. Shit. Okay, I'll, I'll give them names now. Okay, we'll call this guy John here, and we'll call this guy Jack. Okay. All right. So the story goes, John and Jack. You know, they are two very um, you know enthusiastic entrepreneurs, and uh, they had this business idea. 
the business idea is simple. Basically, they reared this cow. They have a cow over here, and this cow produces excellent milk. Okay. And uh, what they want to do is they want to go somewhere far away uh, where there's a place where there's no cow so that they can sell bottles of milk produced by this cow. Okay, so the place is pretty far away. Uh, the two of them pack their stuff and they bring this cow along and they're going to go there. Okay, um, from experience, uh, this cow at any, tri uh, at any time okay, can produce up to a maximum of 10 bottles of milk. Alright, so you got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 bottles of milk, okay, and they intend to sell each bottle of milk at a nominal fee of $10, okay, so essentially, how much they expect to make out of this is $100, because if you've got 10 bottles multiplied by $10, uh, 10 bottles multiplied by $10, uh, they should make a profit of $10, uh, I don't know, you know, entrepreneurs, they are driven by a lot of, of, of things, uh, but um, something irrelevant, but maybe John and Jack, uh, they are they're competing over the girl or something like that, okay? So, okay, um, it's day one, and the two of them set off, okay? So, along the journey, you know, it's, 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 pretty, it's a pretty long journey, and it's hot, right? So, all of a sudden, John, you know, he, he feels a little bit thirsty, right? So, you know, John John turns around and tells Jack, he says, hey, dude, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling kind of thirsty, um, you know, I've, I happen to have $10 in my pocket right now. Okay, I've got $10 in my pocket, you know, just my savings. Um, do you mind if I squeeze the cow's tits for a bottle of milk and I'll give you this $10 for it, you know, just assume that I buy it from you. So Jack thought that, hey, that, that makes sense. I mean, you know, um, at least at least the, that bottle of beer is not given for free, right? Okay, so John takes his $10 and gives it to Jack. Okay, and you've got one bottle of beer, uh, of beer, of milk that has been bought up by John and John drinks it. Okay, so John is happy and then they start walking and all of a sudden, okay, Jack starts to get thirsty too. So Jack turns to John and he says that, hey, you know what, dude, I'm, I'm pretty thirsty. Can I give you this $10 back, you know, and um, let me squeeze a tit of a cow so that I can have uh, a bottle of uh, milk as well. So John you know, felt the same way, and you're like, okay, sure, I think that makes sense, you know, $10, um, uh, is, is, is being paid back, right, so the value of the, of the milk bottle, you know, is paid for, so the $10 goes back to John, okay, and another bottle of milk is gone, okay, so they keep walking, and this happens again, and you know what, it happens until all 10 bottles of milk has been used up, you know, they, they, they keep squeezing the tits of the cow, you know, and 10 bottles of milk is, has been um, drank, drank up already, okay? And when they reach their destination, they realize that there's no more milk left in the cow's tits, and they're left with nothing, okay? So, um, how does this story relate to the equation that we had? Okay, so, <coughs> here we go. We've got M v equals to p y okay so how much money was there in this simple economy over here there was a piece of ten dollar note right see there was a piece of ten dollar note that john was holding on to in his pocket so we've got ten dollars multiplied by the velocity of money okay here's where you will really understand the concept of velocity okay so how many times of this was this ten dollars exchanged between john and jack Okay, so when there was one bottle of milk, okay, this was exchanged once. When there's two bottles of milk, this was exchanged twice. Three bottles of milk consumed, three times, four bottles of milk consumed, four times, blah, 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 blah. So therefore, this ten, this piece of $10 was being um, exchanged 10 times. Okay, so you've got $10 multiplied by 10 times equals 2. Okay, so what is the price level of uh, the goods that we're seeing here? Okay, so one bottle of milk was sold for ten dollars. Okay, and what is output? Now you understand that output is the total amount of goods and services that has been sold or produced. Okay, and this is a uh, real term, so we're essentially counting how many products. So let's look at the cows whose tits have been uh, squeezed throughout the journey. Um, how many bottles of milk did our dear cow produce? 10, right? So essentially 10 bottles of milk is the 
real output or real GDP, right? Multiplied by 10 units. So can you see that this actually makes sense because $100 equals to $100. Okay, so now this is how the equation makes sense and this is how um, some smart guy in the past you know, came up with this thing called the quantity theory of money. So now how can we apply this quantity, of, quantity theory of money into uh, what, we can, what we study now in the modern times of macroeconomics, right? Okay, so I'm going to do some mathematics here you just follow me okay so we've got mv equals to py what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna learn both sides of the equation so once i learn both sides of the equation i can actually separate them using the plus sign so i've got ln m plus ln v equals to ln p plus ln y okay then after that what i want to do is I'm very interested in the rate of change. So I'm going to differentiate with respect to time, where time is denoted as a small letter t. Okay, so I'm going to start differentiating now. Okay, once I differentiate this, I'm going to get this guy turned around. Okay, and I'm going to have uh, dm over d. Okay, and then same thing for B. For V, I'm going to turn this guy around and I'm going to differentiate whatever that's inside of the lawn. So I'm going to get this. Okay, oh sorry, this is a plus here. And then same thing for the rest. Now I'm just going through motion. Um, okay, D, Y. Okay, all right, great. So now what we want to do is um, we want to uh, multiply everybody by dt so that we can get rid of dt. Okay, um, multiply by dt, and this is what we're going to get. We're going to get dm over m plus dv over v equals to oh man, this p. Uh, dp over p plus y a dy over y okay all right we're almost done now um, we're gonna make one simple assumption okay we're gonna make the assumption that the velocity of money because it is determined by institutional factors um, you know such as how much does it cost for you to withdraw money um, you know uh, basically, just take this as constant. Okay, so if the change in V, okay, throughout each time period, okay, is constant, therefore, this whole thing equals to zero. Okay, so essentially what we have left is that we have the growth rate of money, which I'm going to denote as MG. So MG is the uh, growth rate of money. This is actually just a simple way of showing it. Equals to now the change in P over P. Um, for each period that is also known as inflation, okay, plus the growth rate of the economy, YG, okay. So essentially, the quantity theory of money has been reduced to this form over here, alright. And I'm gonna make, and no, this is not an assumption. Um, this is something that is given. Um, what happens to output in the long run? Output in the long run goes back to its original level where full employment occurs. So therefore, the growth rate of output in the long run, essentially this is actually equals to zero. So you have your quantity theory of money where um, the growth rate of money equals to your inflation rate. Now, so what, what, what implications you know, do we have with this? Um, it's simple. When your money, when the rate of when okay, when your money grows, your price level is going to grow as well. And how much it grows is exactly one for one. So if let's say my money, my money supply, okay, is going to increase by twenty percent a year, okay, that means inflation is going to increase by twenty percent a year as well. Uh, inflation is 
20%, okay? Uh, in inflation is not increasing, but as in the price level will increase by 20% as well. Okay, so now this thing here, okay, actually explains what we call money neutrality. Okay, money is neutral. Neutrality, okay. Money is neutral. Uh, that means it has got no effect on any real variables like your real interest, your GDP, uh, okay, your real money balances, and uh, what have you. All the things that is real. Okay, the only things that change are the nominal things like the amount of money you have, uh, the, the wage rate, not the real wage, but the nominal wage. Uh, so money supply, uh, nominal wage, price level, uh, nominal interest okay these are the only things that's changed um, and the real variables stay the same okay so um, how you can apply this you know to, to other macroeconomic um, models is for example your ADAS okay so I'm just gonna show you a quick sketch of your ADAS okay and this is uh, Y this is P okay you have your aggregate demand, aggregate supply. Sorry, this is SRAS. Okay, it's short run aggregate supply, and in the long run, we know that um, everybody just comes back to, to why. To, okay, we'll call this, um, yeah, why not? Okay, so this is your long run aggregate supply curve. Okay, so, um, okay, let's go through that one by one. Okay, I'm gonna put the price level here. Okay, and uh, the price level is also equals to the price expectation level of of the of uh, laborers. Okay, so now when money supply increases, uh, let's say that the government um, you know embarks on a monetary expansion efforts, um, and what's going to happen is that your AD curve is going to shift to the right. Okay, uh, I, you should brush up your basics to see why. So your AD curve is going to shift to the right. Okay, this is AD one. Okay, and output is going to go up to Y1 and the price level here is now P1 which is more than the uh, level of price expectation uh, of the laborers, right? So at this point of time, uh, I think you would know that this is a short run and then in the long run, what's going to happen is that the uh, SRES is just going to shift up again, okay? So um, this is what happens, okay? When uh, output increases, Okay, your price level is going to increase because at this point over here, okay, uh, your workers and your machines are actually working over time. Okay, and once they work over time, they're going to ask for higher nominal wages. Okay, so uh, hi higher nominal wages, okay. Uh, it's going to lead to a higher price because when we, we saw from the price setting model that uh, your price level equals to a markup of the wage rate that is being paid to the workers because firms need to earn profit. So when this increases, this increases, therefore this has gone up to this. Okay, so now that's a short run. Okay, now uh, we're going to go into the long run. Okay, so we're going to understand how the SRS is going to shift up. Okay, um, I'm supposed to explain this in detail in another video, but it's okay. We'll just do a little bit of that now. So the reason why the SRAS is going to shift up, okay, is because of another round that your wage rate is going to shift up. Okay, but why does a wage rate shift up again? Initially, we understood that, uh, you know, the real wage, uh, the, the real wage, the nominal wage has shifted up because of this thing. But uh, recalling your um, price, I'm sorry, your wage setting model, you have got the real nominal wage equals to your price expectation multiplied by 1 plus A minus, uh, sorry, Z minus AU. Okay, just a recap. This is price expectation. This is all the unemployment benefits. Okay, uh, this is your level of unemployment. This is basically a parameter that explains what is the effect of your level of unemployment relating to your wage rate. Okay, so now we know that unemployment has dropped, okay, because now they are working over time, unemployment has dropped, therefore if this goes down, this goes up, this goes down, this goes up, okay, so when this goes down, this goes up, and this relates to this, and therefore this, and this explains a short run, 
Now, going to the uh, explanation short run here. Now, going into the long run, as you can see, the price level is more than the expectations of uh, price that the laborers have. Okay, so therefore, what they want to do is because if they want to keep their real wage, okay, constant. They are going to revise our price expectations. So this price expectation here is going to rise up. Okay, this is going to rise up. I'm going to use another color because uh, this is the long run. This is going to rise up, uh, which caused this to rise up. So you know they are going to bargain for higher wages to keep up with prices. So this is going to go up. This is going to go up. This is going to go up one more time, and this is going to go up one bloody more time. Okay, um. It, this is troublesome, but uh, just stick with me. I think you guys got it already. Okay, so when this goes up, that's where your SRES is going to shift up. Okay, so that's why the long run equilibrium is here. Okay, they all stop negotiating until you reach B, long run equilibrium point where the real output or the real values are the same. Your real GDP is the same, your real wage is the same, your real interest is the same, and what have you. Okay, so this is SRAS1. So essentially, the economy has moved like that. Okay, now to apply the quantity theory of money to this is that, okay, the... Okay, so this is P2 equals to P2E. Now, you're going to ask me where the P1, where the P1 go. Um, P1 didn't go anywhere. There wasn't any P1. Uh, I simply put... P to P two because it just looks nice. Okay, so to explain um, how I'm going to use the um, quantity theory of money in this, it's actually a very small step. You know, uh, you might actually get turned off that you know this video is so long, but it's you know you need to just uh, uh, explain one simple part. But this is very important because you know um, the idea of money neutrality applies to the long run. Okay, so it, it, if you can understand the quantity theory of money. Uh, then you can understand, you know, macroeconomics in the long run. So basically, this change in price over here, or what we call the inflation for that particular year, okay, is equals to the growth of the money that that the that the government has put in. Okay, so to conclude, um, monetary policy in the long run has got no effects on the real economy. Um, there is only it only has got inflationary, um, you know, implications on the economy. So that's it. Okay, uh, this is the quantity theory of money. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and you enjoyed the um, the, the story about the cow. Okay, so um, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to please feel free to email me or, or drop a comment. All right, thank you and have a nice day.